I wouldn't blame you if you greeted the news that in 2022, Netflix was set to release a new film adaptation of Eric Maria Remarque's 1929 novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, with disdain. It's by now a well-worn trope that every couple of years we get a big war movie that seems designed specifically to garner awards attention. 1917 just recently, Dunkirk and Hacksaw Ridge right before that, and on and on and on, all the way back to the very first Best Picture winner, 1927's Wings. Not only that, but hadn't Hollywood already done All Quiet on the Western Front before? The 1930 version, directed by Lewis Milestone, is widely considered one of the greatest achievements in the genre. They even did a TV version in 1979. Why bother with this material again? Can't we just let it rest? You know what? Same. I can't begrudge you those feelings, and I frankly share that frustration. However, I do think the release of this latest version is a great excuse to revisit the original and understand why it made such an impact when it was first released. So in this video, I'm going to break down the very explosive response to the original film, the ways in which the Netflix version differs from and responds to that film, and why this story is worth thinking about in 2023. Hopefully this video adds context to your viewing experience that affects how you think about its message and gives you the tools to determine whether or not you think the adaptation is successful. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thanks to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. Get a whole month free at Mubi.com slash BeKindRewind. So one of the things that might catch your eye about Eric Maria Remarque's novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, is its publication date, 1929, a full decade after the end of World War I. I think this is a good place to start if we're trying to put ourselves in the mindset of the novel's original audience. I won't get into too many details about World War I here, just to keep things focused, but in the broadest sense, it was awful. Caused by a convoluted mess of alliances, nationalism, and poor diplomacy, it is frequently characterized as one of the most pointless conflicts in history. Situated at a collision of eras, the technological innovations of its participants outpaced their tactical imaginations. This is a war that began with cavalry and ended with tanks. So soldiers were placed in impossible positions that almost guaranteed their death. And estimates vary, but casualties range from 8 to 10 million for military personnel and 6 to 7 million civilians, making it not only one of the most pointless, but also one of the deadliest conflicts in global history. I won't go further into details of how truly gruesome the conditions were for both the soldiers and on the home front, but if you're interested in that, I'd suggest Peter Jackson's documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old, because although the technology kind of treads into the uncanny valley a little bit, it does a pretty good job of painting that picture. As you might imagine, once the war was over, people were ready to move on. Nobody was in the mood to think about it, certainly not in an entertainment context. Historian Madras Eckstein's writes, for a decade after the war, publishers, theater directors, and filmmakers had treated war material gingerly, viewing it as a poor commercial proposition, on the assumption that the public wished, contrary to the annual Remembrance Day extortions, to forget the war. The public, unsympathetic to painful reminders, was more interested in a release of pent-up tensions through jazz, risque films, and flippant reviews. The war would not sell. Frivolous and sentimental entertainment would. But in spite of the jazz and the risque films and whatever else people used to move on from this enormous tragedy, memories of the war could not be fully forgotten. Too much had changed, too many had died, too much anxiety still brewed under the surface. This is where Remark comes in. Just 18 years old when he was conscripted into the German army, Remark served on the front line in Belgium before suffering an injury and returning to the home front. Although questions remain about his service, one thing is certain. He became convinced that the war had destroyed his generation, not just literally in the trenches, but also mentally and spiritually. His novel would be a post-war comment on the way war changed how he viewed power structures, how he experienced pain, how he experienced patriotism. The novel follows Paul Boimer, a German teenager who whipped up into a patriotic fervor, joins the military with a group of his schoolmates. We follow him through terrifying battles, through the loss of his closest friends, and learn what he does to survive before he ultimately loses his life in the final pages. I think one of the things that goes under discussed with this book is how angry it is. 
There are very famous, almost journalistic descriptions of combat in which he describes thoroughly and with little emotion the sound of bombs dropping, injuries, fighting off hordes of rats, the kind of literal physical traumas of war. But those episodes are sandwiched between these contemplations that speak specifically to the psychological state of the soldiers and their powerlessness in this situation. It was, as Eckstein's put it, a confession of personal despair, but it was also an indignant denunciation of the insensate social and political order, inevitably of that order which had produced the horror and destruction of the war, but particularly of the one which could not liquidate the war and deal with the aspirations of veterans. What Remarque was saying with this novel clearly resonated with readers throughout Europe and the United States. It was as if they had been waiting for someone to finally describe those feelings, the simmering unrest and pervasive sense of loss undergirding post-war life in the 1920s. We'll talk more in a minute about the political or critical reactions to this book, but right now it's important to know that this book was wildly popular. By the end of 1929, over a half million copies in Germany were sold, with another million in Britain, France, and the United States added on. The book also spawned a veritable genre as novels and memoirs chronicling soldiers' experiences suddenly filled bookstores throughout Europe. Those stories had their merits, but All Quiet clearly reigned as the best of them all. Let's move on now from Germany and Remark across the Atlantic to Hollywood, where German-American president and founder of Universal Pictures, Carl Lemley, was looking for material for a big prestige picture. To Lemley, All Quiet was the perfect vehicle for beginning the transformation of Universal from a minor studio specializing in the production of inoffensive little comedies and low-budget westerns to a major Hollywood institution capable of challenging the likes of MGM, Paramount, and Warner Brothers. So he and his son flew to Germany to seek the rights of Remark for a film adaptation. Remark accepted on the grounds that they not make significant alterations or additions to the original material in the novel. The Lemleys agreed and quickly went into production. While the film rearranges events in the book in favor of a chronological story versus flashbacks of various episodes as the book is written, and things are cut or trimmed here and there for efficiency, you can tell that screenwriters Maxwell Anderson and George Abbott took Remark's request seriously. Whole paragraphs from this novel are copied word for word and used as dialogue in this film. I'd go barefoot over barbed wire for him, but do him any good. You cannot miss Remark's point of view because they are giving it to you quite explicitly. I think some modern viewers who are less versed in watching classic films may have a little trouble with the acting in this film. There's a very prominent boyish American G-mister quality to the actors that occasionally feels very out of tune with what we're now used to seeing in war films. That said, letting Remark's writing do the talking is extraordinarily effective, particularly because Lou Ayers as Paul is such a sincere actor. He pleads so softly and earnestly in his monologues that his outbursts hit twice as hard when they finally come. The clearest strength of this film, though, is its combat scenes. Filmed on 20 acres of Laguna Beach ranch land, Universal hired more than 2,000 extras, many of them actual World War I veterans, which gives these scenes a sense of enormity and authenticity that is nearly unparalleled for this era. Other World War I films like Wings and The Big Parade have aerial stunts and outdoor sequences that are undeniably cinematic, but All Quiet best captures the brutality of the trenches, the relentless layer upon layer of soldiers who blindly run toward automatic weaponry out of duty, only to meet their deaths. The film isn't as visibly violent as the novel, which pulls no punches when it comes to the gritty details. You rarely see blood, and you never see guts spilling out all over the place like in the new one. But if anything, this film proves that you don't need all of that to make a battle remarkably effective. The carnage is jarring, but it is the artful rendering of these scenes that give them their emotional resonance. Part of this is thanks to director Lewis Milestone's ingenuity. Where many early sound films feel very static, given the size of the camera and the limited capabilities of sound recording equipment, he liberates the camera by mounting it on a large mobile crane to film and choreograph these scenes, which enhances their scale. He also uses tracking shots cleverly, not only running across the trenches as the soldiers lie in wait, but also following them as they charge onto the battlefield, 
Panning quickly across the front line as soldier after soldier falls, he rhythmically cuts back to firing weaponry, adding a stressful pace to the scene, or to Paul, who's witnessing the trauma in real time. Upon its release, All Quiet the Western Front, the film, became a similar sensation to All Quiet on the Western Front, the novel. There was the initial surprise that a war film even performed well in the first place. As one paper put it, some of us old timers can remember back to the days when the war was supposed to be cold as a subject of popular interest. A year ago, it seemed that the Great War had finally been terminated in Hollywood. The last imitations of What Price Glory and Big Parade had flopped, and talkies had come along to divert the attention of film producers into other channels. But then, ultimately, an acknowledgement of its quality, and that it differed from anything they'd seen about the war on film before. I've mentioned a few films about World War I already, namely Wings and The Big Parade, but All Quiet clearly was attempting to do something different. Those films, while obviously touching on the prevailing notion that the war had been a grave mistake, used the war as a backdrop for some other additional drama. As Mark Zockleben points out in his book, World Politics on Screen, both films used a love story to help push the narrative. While the primary protagonists in each of the films suffer injuries and lose friends, the films have a happy ending as the soldiers find love. All Quiet was the most explicit of them in its anti-war intentions. And while I think modern audiences have some rightful cynicism about whether or not any war film can actually be anti-war, I think it's fair to say that most American critics sincerely received this film as a genuine condemnation of a war they had likely lived through. Many critics described their physical reactions when watching this film. It was a harrowing, gruesome photograph of war, so compelling, so real and terrible that it leaves you in a cold sweat. Realism reaches its zenith with this picture. I hate it. It made me shudder with horror. Audiences should prepare to be shocked, shaken, and remorselessly swept along by this realistic depiction of what war does to a group of nice lads. It may shatter your nerves. It may send you out of the theater mentally and physically exhausted. It may even stir up memories better forgotten, but you will have seen a war against war. Of course, All Quiet had a significant advantage over previous war films when it came to affecting audiences. Sound. Now this is an early sound film and there are tiny moments where that's kind of obvious. One operation after another since five o'clock this morning. 16 deaths a day. This was Milestone's first sound film after all. But it's wild to imagine what it must have felt like for many audience members to attach the piercing sounds of falling bombs or the clattering of machine gun fire to these images for the first time. Those effects are integral to the intensity of the combat scenes and help us understand why one might go mad hearing this unending barrage day in and day out. As the National Board of Review, review, pointed out, after seeing this film, no one can deny the potency of sound effects to heighten the power of the motion picture. Critics also took note to emphasize the universality of the story, which is a huge part of the novel's international success. You might assume it would be awkward to have a sympathetic German protagonist in an American-made war film at a time when memories of that war were very fresh. However, All Quiet was written and filmed in a way that made this an easy hurdle for audiences to overcome. Aside from their uniforms and a few home front scenes at the beginning of the film, there's almost nothing to indicate that these soldiers are actually German. Its focus on the general experience of the soldier united audiences across nations who, although they had fought on different sides of the war, witnessed similar traumas and sank into similar disillusionment. It was written without venom, without propaganda. His story is the story of every man who went into the trenches, every man of every nation who donned a uniform when a mighty civilization suddenly went insane. It probably doesn't surprise you to hear that All Quiet on the Western Front did really well at the box office and sailed through to Best Picture. I personally couldn't find much about the campaign for this win. This would have been the third Academy Awards ceremony ever, so at this point, most cinema magazines were still explaining what the awards even were, not so much digging into the intricacies of behind-the-scenes voting procedures. Now, the Academy Awards on November 5th, 1930, were not the end of All Quiet's journey. At this time, one-third of Hollywood's box office revenues came from foreign markets. One of the biggest of those markets was Germany. So most studios 
made a significant effort to appeal to that market and release their films there. Okay, cool. Well, we've got a super popular, well-respected film based on a super popular, well-respected novel written by a German. Should be smooth sailing, right? Wrong. It turns out that All Quiet on the Western Front, the book, did not have the same reception in Germany as it did elsewhere, largely because the political situation in Germany was a tad more complicated, to say the least. After World War I, Germany experienced deep economic despair, hyperinflation where money could be more valuable as wallpaper than as actual currency, political turmoil from forming a new government, assassinations, etc., etc., etc. And remember the novel's release date, things were only getting more complicated with the onset of the Great Depression. Well, guess fucking who was exploiting all that instability to stoke hatred and gain power? In this environment, World War I was a very contentious issue. The Nazi party and other extreme right-wing groups believed that Germany had been failed by the leaders who signed the armistice that ended the war and blamed those politicians for everything that had happened since, coming up with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories to spin their story. They wanted to glorify the war and all the quote-unquote beautiful sacrifices that valorous soldiers had made in it. So to portray it as a mistake or as an unnecessary immoral absurdity was an unacceptable insult. By the time the film All Quiet on the Western Front landed in Germany, the Nazis had enough power to make a stink about it. Universal saw this coming and worked with the German embassy to cut scenes in the film that might offend German audiences, like this one where an officer cowers in fear and won't charge into battle. They assumed this would be enough to appease conservative critics. And they were wrong. The film premiered in Germany in December 1930. The first screening was fine, with general reactions similar to how it had been received elsewhere, positive but stunned and shaken. Later screenings, though, not so much. Nazis purchased a large block of tickets to occupy about one-third of the audience. During the film, they screamed anti-Semitic insults at the screen, set off stink bombs, threw sneeze powder, and released mice into the aisles. Part of this extreme reaction was that it was an extremely well-known property, and part of this was because it was a specifically American-made film, a piece of cultural propaganda made by foreigners, part of the ongoing war against Germany by her enemies. We know this because a nearly identical film had come out six months earlier, West Front 1918, based on the novel Four from the Infantry by Ernst Johansson, illustrates the horrors of war through the lives of four infantrymen in the trenches. This was director G.W. Papp's first sound film, and while it shares many themes and details with All Quiet on the Western Front, it's a much more pessimistic film, bleaker in tone and specifically concerned with how the war also destroyed the home front, especially economically. It's not subtle in its politics. Alle. It even ends with a foreboding question mark, as if sensing the events that were yet to come. That film didn't receive the same dramatic, fierce protest that All Quiet did, at least initially. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's chief propagandist, who was in attendance at that stink bomb sneeze powder screening, orchestrated a succession of boisterous demonstrations aimed at keeping all quiet on the Western Front from the German screen. In each case, the Berlin police proved capable of restraining protesters, but Goebbels' actions set in motion a series of events which subsequently embroiled the film in both German and Austrian politics for the next six months. Eventually, it was brought to the attention of the Supreme Film Censor Board, a strongly conservative organization with the power to ban the film from German theaters altogether, which of course it did. So was West Front 1918 in 1933, the same year the Gestapo ordered destructions of copies of Remarque's novels as well. While this situation didn't necessarily signal the scope of the crimes the Nazi regime would eventually commit, it clearly indicated that a new era in Germany had begun. W.R. Wilkerson, editor of The Hollywood Reporter, wrote, The military spirit of the German people, created through years of training, is only dormant, not dead. Such a spirit, with centuries of growth behind it, cannot be killed, even through such a lesson as the Great War. It is comparatively easy to revive, much easier than one would imagine. 
but to revive it successfully, to fan it again into flame, cannot be done if the horrors of war are to be spread before the eyes of the people so dramatically and realistically as in all quiet on the Western Front. One of the first questions we have to ask about this adaptation is, why this, why now? An English draft of this screenplay spent many years in limbo, but received an adrenaline shot when director Edward Berger came on board. Berger believed that All Quiet on the Western Front was ripe for adaptation for two main reasons. First, he wanted to use the film to comment on the political situation in Europe. Now, this film was made prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, so while it might be assumed that this film is a comment on that war, that wasn't the original intention. Rather, Berger felt this story could respond to the growing xenophobia, nationalism, and dissatisfaction with international cooperative organizations within Europe. Second, All Quiet on the Western Front had only been adapted in English, and Berger wanted to go back to the German novel and make a German film out of it. He told The Hollywood Reporter, I watch a lot of American and English films, and I find them extremely entertaining, but I feel they never show my perspective, the perspective I have as a German, not that of America that saved Europe from fascism or England, which was attacked and drawn into a war against their will, whose soldiers returned home, certainly traumatized and psychologically broken, but celebrated as heroes, where the war is an event that enters the national psyche as something that the society is in part proud of. For us, it's the exact opposite. In our national psyche, there is nothing but guilt, horror, terror, and destruction. And we have ourselves to blame for that. It's not like someone attacked us, it's our own fault. I think that makes us look at war differently. So doing a war film as a German means looking at it differently. What exactly that looks like in his film, we'll get into. So Berger and screenwriters Leslie Patterson and Ian Stokel set about reworking the English draft into a new German version. And wow, did they change it a lot. In fact, the more I think about this film, the more I consider it generous to even call it an adaptation of the novel, as opposed to just another World War I film that happens to share a few characteristics with the novel. That said, I do think there's value in understanding how the film responds to the original material from this vantage point in history. As I mentioned earlier, the original film is highly indebted to the novel, borrowing much of the dialogue from the text. Leaning on Remark's words so heavily can occasionally give the film a play-like quality that, while beautiful and incisive, wouldn't quite work in a modern film. Instead, Berger goes for a standard show-don't-tell approach, which I think has its positives and its negatives. On the one hand, the dialogue feels much more natural, less pulled straight from a narrativized internal monologue. For example, in this scene, Paul regrets having stabbed a French soldier as he watches him die, so he tends to his wounds and offers him water. We don't literally need to hear him say, You see, when you jumped in here, you were my enemy, and I was afraid of you. But you're just a man like me, and I killed you. Beautiful as I actually think this monologue is, we can infer this through his actions, which is exactly what Berger chooses to do. The Netflix version subtracts dialogue, but hits the same plot points and lets the audience do some of the interpretive work. He does this effectively throughout the film. We can infer how indifferent Paul becomes to death, not by hearing it through a speech, but by watching him obediently walk through the trenches to collect dog tags. We can infer Kat is resourceful by watching him offer a piece of bread to Paul instead of just saying that he's resourceful. Still, by distancing itself from the novel in this way, the film also loses track of the original film's nuance. The scene with the French soldier is actually also a great example of this. Paul's monologue in 1930 not only expresses sympathy for the other soldier and deep regret for his actions, but also specifically blames larger, uncontrollable forces for putting them in that position in the first place. Oh God, why did they do this to us? We only wanted to live, you and I. Why should they send us out to fight each other? By omitting this speech in the latest version, we lose that understanding of Paul as someone who's thinking about the condition of the common soldier in a wider conflict. It's still a sad and effective scene, it's just lost a layer of meaning. There are ample examples of this. In 1930, Paul constantly remarks upon figures in leadership positions who adversely affect his experience with the war. Take the character Himmelstoss, who, though a postman in civilian life, serves as a drill sergeant of sorts for the boys when they enter training. Suffering under his vindictiveness, 
Paul reflects on how powerless, anonymous men who may not be abusive in normal life suddenly turn into soulless monsters the minute they're given a modicum of power over others. Himmelstoss is entirely omitted from the 2022 version. Another example, in the original, Paul returns home on leave and visits the classroom where he had initially absorbed wartime propaganda about becoming a hero and the honor of serving the fatherland. When asked to discuss his experience with the class, he delivers a bitter, sorrowful warning to the students, blaming the messaging he received there for misleading him. I heard you in here reciting that same old stuff, making more Iron Men, more young heroes, you still think it's beautiful and sweet to die for your country, don't you? Well, we used to think you knew. Again, this episode is omitted in the 2022 version. Clearly, in this recent film, Paul morphs from a bright-eyed, excited young lad into a deadened husk of his former self, which is the same arc as in the original material. And Felix Kammerer is great, by the way. But this film reduces the cause of his disillusionment to the violence around him, rather than the violence, as well as the clear dysfunction and carelessness of the systems around him. Paul almost never thinks about why he's there, nor does he interact with his superiors until the very end. Instead, he's just put through barrage after barrage, carnage that shocks in its severity and instructs the audience to reach the fairly obvious conclusion that trench warfare destroys a person's soul. Still, that doesn't mean Berger's version is shying away from the wider context, in fact, quite the opposite. The film removes Paul as a character from any larger conversations about the war, but substitutes his personal introspection with depictions of actual international diplomacy. In perhaps the most obvious change from the novel and 1930 version, Berger's screenplay cuts between Paul's experience on the front line and a German delegation traveling to negotiate the armistice that ends the war. Our protagonist in these scenes is Matthias Erzberger, who was a real-life politician who spent the final years of the war advocating peace. Played by Daniel Bruhl, he functions within this screenplay as the voice of reason. Knowing what we know about the front line from Paul, we root for him to quickly end the madness and sign the document, even as other members of the delegation push back against Germany's capitulation. Erzberger's inclusion in this story is striking to me, largely because of the events I described earlier. In 1930, Nazis opposed All Quiet because it didn't properly glorify the war, because it didn't perpetuate the lie that government officials who signed the armistice were criminals who had betrayed Germany, stabbed it in the back. In real life, Erzberger was targeted for his involvement with the armistice, and in 1921 was assassinated by members of a right-wing terrorist group. A terrorist group which, no shit, was deeply anti-Semitic and later aligned with the Nazi party. This connection creates an uncanny timeline, from Erzberger signing the treaty in real life, to his murder, to Nazis denouncing the end of the war, then protesting a film that openly called that war a mistake, to now this version of that same film framing Erzberger as a hero. Berger isn't blind to this history, and to illuminate it, he pairs this real-life political figure with an entirely fictional one, the imaginary General Friedrichs, who represents the warmongering contingent of the German army that opposes surrender. This character seems to have been invented, A, to demonstrate the contrasting conditions afforded to officers versus the infantry. It's very easy to make decisions about other people's lives from a place of comfort and B, to make the film's new ending work. The ending in the original film is extraordinarily poetic. Having lost Kat, his only remaining reason to live, Paul returns to the trenches, reaches for a butterfly, and with the camera hovering over his hand, we see him collapse. This scene isn't attached to any particular battle or event within the war. The focus is simply the end of Paul's life. Because in the Netflix film, we have just seen the signing of the armistice, The screenplay needs to find some reason Paul is still sent into battle regardless, where he will eventually die. This is where Friedrichs comes in. He emerges from his den of comfort to announce that the cowardly social democrats have sold out the German people by signing the armistice. So in order to return home as heroes, they must strike the French with all they have before the treaty officially kicks in at 11 a.m. This obviously did not happen in real life. If Paul can survive the next 15 minutes, he will have survived the war. 
but of course, he doesn't. This change brings a kind of race against the clock element that I think is better suited to a run-of-the-mill action film than something like All Quiet on the Western Front. But I see what Berger intends with this ending. It elaborates on the suspicions that Wilkerson and Pabst had in 1930, that sense that World War I wasn't really the end. Although Erzberger is temporarily successful, General Friedrichs and his warring spirit survive now armed with a new political agenda and willing to send young men to die to see it enacted. I don't necessarily think this structure, the addition and insertion of these scenes, achieves quite as intimate an understanding of how war and a lust for power can corrupt and erode every level of society all the way down to the postman. I also think it comes at the expense of Paul's characterization and the point of view of the common soldier, which seems to be the main point of the novel. However, to me, this is what makes this adaptation German, like Berger intended. In breaking down these disputes between political factions, by naming key figures in German history, by signaling dark conflicts ahead, this film has a very specific German perspective. It doesn't aim for the universality of the original, whose audience would have been composed of veterans around the world who needed their voices heard. And while there's some discomfort in the idea of so drastically altering the text when Remark's only request for the original adaptation was that the filmmakers not make significant alterations or additions to the original material, this version is speaking from a vantage point Remark did not have in 1929 when he wrote the book. As Berger told Deadline, he didn't know yet that there was going to be a Second World War. And so as a modern audience, we have the perspective that the First World War was just the beginning of things, that there would be even bigger terrors ahead. To look back at that history, to try to understand and process it, these are conversations that Germans have been engaging with for decades. On January 24th, it was announced that All Quiet on the Western Front received nine Oscar nominations, including Best Picture. Only time will tell if it will take home that award like its predecessor. The film's reception this time around has undoubtedly been affected by and attached to the looming shadow of the war in Ukraine. Certainly the film's best picture BAFTA win was framed by the media as a reaction to that conflict. While nine nominations obviously suggest that the Academy appreciated this film, I'm not convinced it will have resonated here the way it has in Europe. I have to laugh at the simultaneous presence of Top Gun and All Quiet on the Western Front in this category, because it kind of proves Berger's point. Top Gun appeals to the post-World War II American tradition of portraying ourselves as ultimately triumphant and invariably just. It's flag-waving American exceptionalist camp that um, seems to have some ideological tension with All Quiet on the Western Front. Every full-grown emperor needs one war to make him famous. Why, that's history. Yeah, generals too. Sure. They and need manu war. And manufacturers, they get rich. This is exactly the kind of film that Germans cannot make, and the kind that America probably shouldn't, but likely will for the rest of time. Telling these stories can be frustrating because we tell them again and again and again, hoping that eventually the lesson will sink in, and yet somehow these films always seem to be relevant. Hell, the day I finished this script, I also watched the news, and two of the main stories were A, neo-Nazis bullying audience members at a theater, a revival of Parade, a musical about anti-Semitism in the South, and B, Ukrainian soldiers who have been living in trenches for months. Echoes of these events undeniably resound today. So if you're even slightly interested in checking this film out, do. There are, of course, other changes that I haven't addressed in this video. The French women they visit, Cat's death, the handkerchief. But I hope I've done a good job with the major themes and outlining how this story interacts with history. Once again, I'd like to thank Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected by a wonderfully talented team of curators. And what's really cool is there's a new film highlighted every single day right at the top of the page. So no matter when you choose to log in, they've got you covered with a film I guarantee you're not going to see on most streaming sites. 
They also put together timely series for you to dive into. I just added a bunch to my watch list from Cut to Black, celebrating black cinema, which celebrates the incredible wealth of black artistry, both in front of and behind the camera. For fellow film history nerds, there's Oscar Michaud and Portrait of Jason. But for those of you who might be interested in more current work, they've included films by the always impressive Alice Diop and Martine Sims. I personally am pretty excited to watch this Basquiat documentary because, you know, his work has become quite ubiquitous in pop culture lately, and it's always good to get back in touch with the actual artist as opposed to the brand. I think if you're a cinephile, getting a movie subscription is truly one of the best things you can do to broaden your taste and expose yourself to great work from around the world. The good news is you can get a whole month free at movie.com slash be kind rewind. A world of cinema can be at your fingertips. Get your month free at movie.com slash be kind rewind today.